Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Fayaz Ahmed Ilkal, working as an assistant professor in a Rani Chennamayan University PG Center, Torui Vijaypur. At the outside, I would like to congratulate the team of Government, degree, government First Grade College Hungund for taking this initiative and choosing an apt topic for the FDP program that is MOOCs, e-content development and OER. I warm heartedly wish all a good luck and best of luck for the success of this uh, FDP faculty development program and especially the program director, Dr. S.L. Patil, who happens to be a good friend of mine. When he spoke to me, I was very much upbeat about the topic and the content which he has chosen for this FDP program. And then uh, when I was asked to choose any of the topic, that time I told that e-content and e-resources for academic development is a very apt topic considering the present situation which we are facing post or during COVID-19. So this COVID-19 situation has brought all the academicians and the students a bit uh, in a spot of bother. The spot of bother is that how to complete our syllabus and how to uh, face this difficult situation. Hence, most of the universities and most of the colleges have come up with these uh, FDB programs and then webinars and online lectures. Hence, in this epidemic, the students as well as the teachers are put into test. Hence, that is why that forced me to take up this topic that is e-content and e-resources for academic development. So these things in this presentation, I'll be dealing with a case study. Initially, I will take up a case study in order to show, in order to put forth the problematic of e-content and e-resources, the things which we as a teacher, the things uh, which the students face. Okay, and then why content and e-resource? Why, why we should need, why there, is, why there is a need for this e-content and e-resource? E itself means e, e means electronic and e-resource means electronic resource. And how it is related with academic development? For the information for academic development, from where we are going to get information for academic development and how it will benefit us. Hence, primary sources and then secondary sources, tertiary sources, use of internet in academics all have been packaged in this one presentation of mine. So to begin with, I have taken one case study that is of a school teacher called Radha. Unlike you and me, she also, as a school teacher in some rural place, if not like Hunugun, but in some rural place where she is facing some of the difficulties while teaching her students, she feels that she is the not only she but even the students are highly deprived of learning resources. They have very limited resources. Hence, she is a struggling day in day out to collect and organize learning resources wherever they are available. So, what she used to she used to discuss with her colleagues and her friends, and even she had a face to face um, discussion with her students as well. But then also, somewhere, she lacked that capability or motivation. So because of that, she was not able to do much for them. So this is so happened that during one of the training programs, just like this FDP, okay, she was introduced to an open educational resource and e-content, massive open online courses, etc. and their availability and features. And I hope this uh, faculty development program will serve the purpose just like this. 
So moving ahead, the training made her realize that the ICT has solutions to the problems she was facing in her school. Okay. So this is all how you have to relate yourself to Radha or to any other school teacher or a PU lecturer or a degree college assistant professor or a university professor and, and even from students perspective as well. After undergoing that training, she realized that ICT has solutions to the problem she was facing in her school. And it has, it has become a, like an, uh, um, a boon for her. Okay, now she's empowered in such a way that she can find apt and sufficient resources for her students. There has been lots of difference in her attitude, in her confidence earlier, how, he, how she used to go to this class and how she is going now to the class. She's also able to use, reuse, revise, remix the OERs and share them with her students, colleagues and friends. She has become an example for all. She has helped her students in getting the required latest books, learning materials, resources and information and help them in fulfilling their aspirations. She has now started inspiring many a teacher who are also in the same position as she was once. And this is what this FDP will provide you all. I'm damn sure about it. So to, today, what's happening, the entire world is moving speedily towards di digitization. Everything, the whole world is getting digital. And we have to learn new things using new technologies. This is where some of the traditional teachers, sorry uh, to say this, but some of the traditional teachers are facing difficulty in digitizing themselves, in digitizing their classrooms and making their classes smart, their students smart and themselves smart. I'm sorry, but if you don't become smart, your students will not be smart and your classrooms cannot be converted into class, uh, smart classrooms. Got it. Though our phones are smart, but we are not smart enough. So we have to become smart and thanks to COVID-19, that it has exposed us, it has forced us to move into this digital world and face the difficulties and face the challenges of electronic media or electronic. This is the time for us to wake up and update ourselves because this is the need of the hour. The evolution of computers, especially the internet has affected all spheres of our life. Just recently I heard in the news that even Supreme Court is thinking of making internet as a basic right ten to fifteen years back we used to spend our time mostly in the library for information in books magazines and journals even in 2004 when i was pursuing a phd i had to go to various places in order to collect materials from different different libraries i had to wait uh, for the uh, for the libraries to open and I had to wind up everything before the library closes. And then I had to pay lots of money for Xerox and for print. But now you can get information, you can get resources only on the tips of your fingers. Yes, my dear friends, we are in a globalized world. Now a day we search for information in the websites access to information has become very easy because of information sharing on world wide web it is also called as http or www wherever if you want to search something in google we use this platform so now how this e resource and e content is related to academic development. 
first thing quality of teaching and students learning are determined by the teachers who teach them obviously it is a major major factor we have to motivate the students well trained teachers with required knowledge skills and commitment can develop scientific and critical thinking promote tolerance and develop cultural and social values in them and this is how we can say that we are academically we are growing not only we but even the students are developing and then you know into technologies will make it possible to achieve these by providing new ways to teachers otherwise what happens our students will be smarter than us we will be not able to use digital technology wherein our students will be using it. and we will be cutting a very sorry figure that thing should not happen and these new technologies are placing more demands on teachers to learn how to use them in their teaching and learning processes if you won't deploy this sorry we will be left behind we have to update ourselves so this great transformation is posing challenges most of the teachers they say so in this age from where we should learn who will teach us and why we should ask our juniors hmm, uh, our uh, our young generation to teach us all these things but learning and teaching has no age and even teacher educators in using technologies in creative and productive ways so once if you learn them then the second step will be innovation creativity which will transform you from being a teacher and you will lead towards a smarter teacher hence we as teachers have to meet these new challenges who knows in future what are the challenges which we will be facing and then we have to be continuously acquiring new knowledge and skills to discharge our duties effectively still we can't depend on blackboard and chalk teach the world is changing very dramatically we have to buckle ourselves so information for academic activities why do we need information for academic activities so by acquiring all the information we can put it into our academic activities like teaching research and for publication when you improve yourself when you become smart what do you do you put it into teaching and then after teaching the teaching leads you to research and research leads you to publication this is where ugc investing a lots of time and money they want teachers not only to to teach but also they want them to invest their time into research that is why they are making phd mandatory especially for assistant professors and then they are bringing down number of journals in order to ensure quality and only those papers research papers research articles are uh, given um, value which are been published under ugc care list so this is the purpose and this is how you can academically develop so from where we can collect all these information we can collect all these information from sources and the sources of information are divided into two broad categories that is documentary and non documentary again documentary and non documentary are subdivided into primary sources and then secondary sources and then tertiary sources tertiary is nothing but e content that is electronic content and in non documentary it is formal and informal okay so now documentary sources which are referred to the published and unpublished sources of the print media in all fields of knowledge they may be textual numeric 
or graphic in any physical form in any language produced within the country or outside they are further divided into primary sources secondary sources and then tertiary sources so those who are involved into research they may be very much uh, well versed with these terms primary secondary and tertiary sources so they are usually evidence or primary sources of information so what are these primary sources of information they are usually evidence or accounts of the events practices or conditions being researched so when it comes to literature for us primary source happens novels poems drama which are originally written by that author and anything which is been written about that text or about that writer is called as a second resource <clears throat> and then present information in its original form not interpreted or condensed or evaluated by other writers so if they evaluate it then it becomes second resource not primary resource and which are not created by a person who directly experienced that event so however what constitute a primary source of information depends on the disciple or context how the material is used for example among other diaries interviews minutes of meetings photographs videos artworks artifacts like and again periodicals research reports reports on scientific expedition and then conference proceedings standards and patents thesis and dissertations and also unpublished sources of information like company files laboratory notebooks etc and then a secondary source of information after primary now we move towards secondary source secondary source of information what are these secondary source of information they are critical works which are not directly written by the author or the writer but it is with uh, an observation or criticism of another person about that particular work or about that research or about that particular interview poem uh, survey or whatever it is a secondary source of information is well that was created by someone who did not have a first hand experience or participate in the events being researched and they are generally accounts written after the fact with the benefit of hindsight their own perspective and secondary source describe they analyze interpret evaluate comment on and discuss the evidence provided by primary sources it's an evaluation of primary source so when these books are being used they are considered as a secondary source so they have they are not evidence but rather commentary on and discussion of evidence they just evaluate with the help of these sources about the primary source and then the secondary data is one that has been collected by individuals or agencies for purposes other than those of a particular research study so what constitutes a secondary source of information depends on discipline or how the information is used for example textbooks bibliographies biographical works commentaries criticisms dictionaries <coughs> encyclopedias <coughs> reference books reviews indexing and extracting periodicals yearbooks almanacs handbooks etc
So tertiary sources of information, that is the third source, third type of source. So these works which list primary and secondary resources in a specific subject area. So materials like index, organize and compile citations to and show how secondary and sometimes primary sources could be used. So these materials in which information from secondary source has been digested, reformatted and condensed and put into a convenient, easy to read form. So these resources arrange the information in a helpful way from primary and secondary sources. For example, again, the same, harmonized dictionaries, population registers, statics, statistics, fact books, abstracts, indexes, bibliography of bibliographies, chronologies, classifications, handbooks, guidebooks, and manuals, guide to literature, etc. So let's find out then the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. So primary sources of information are original manuscript, as I had said earlier. They may be documents or records used in preparing a published or unpublished work. For example, an original place of artwork which be considered a primary source. And then secondary source are published or unpublished work that relies on primary source. An article critiquing a place of artwork which would be a secondary source. As I told you, a critical work about one particular text is called a secondary source. And then tertiary source are published or unpublished work that is based on secondary source again. So they can be called as a third form of source or third source of information. An art index would be considered a tertiary source. So it is sometimes difficult to differentiate between primary, secondary and tertiary sources. And there are again two types of sources that is formal and informal. So let us not go much in detail about these sources. These three forms of sources is more than sufficient for you all. So again, I will, before harping upon some other topics, let us take up some basic information about internet. Most of us, we know what is internet, what is broadband, what is fiber net, what is, uh, what was 2G, what was 3G, what is 4G and what is 5G. But we don't have enough information about it. So I would like to throw some light upon this aspect, especially which will help us to acquire some e-resource, which will facilitate us in our academic development. So the things which I'll be covering here is the internet there and now. How the internet works, major features of the internet, online services, internet features in application programs. So now, the internet then and now. So have you ever thought what made to discover the internet or to invent the internet? I would like to take you back to the pages of history, especially during First World War and Second World War. It was created first by Advanced Research Project Agency and the U.S. Department of Defense for Scientific and Military Communications. This was the major difference between United States and the other countries. And this is what made them to be victorious in First World War and Second World War. Directly from White House, the information used to go to the military base through internet. And then after that, it was made public to us. And now we are using it for business purposes and for personal development as well. So internet is a network of interconnected networks. Even if part of its infrastructure was destroyed, data could flow through the remaining networks. 
so the internet uses high speed data lines called backbones to carry data smaller networks content to the backbone enabling any user or any network to exchange data with any other user so this is how the entire internet works local network and then regional network and then there is local network local network regional network that is the backbone of it and that is how the users are being shared just like how we have our aadhar card pan card like that we have our our computers our laptops have their own tcp ip addresses which can be used only for that particular computer or only for that particular internet line so how the internet works here first of all, tcp and ip routing traffic across the internet addressing schemes domains and sub domains as i told you earlier every computer and network on internet uses the same protocols so what is this tcp tcp and ip tcp is transmission control protocol and then ip is internet protocol so no matter what type of computer system you connect to the internet if it uses tcp or ip it can exchange data with any other type of computer so most computers don't connect directly to the internet instead they connect to a smaller network that is connected to the internet backbone and then the internet includes thousands of host computers which provide data and services as requested by client system so that is how we are shared whether we want broadband whether we want uh, fiber net and then in broadband what type of speed we want and for how much gb and for how much money so based upon our usage and speed we are charged high the the price for 2g is not that much as and how we increase our speed the tariff rates go on on and on and on so when you use the internet your pc request data from a host system the request and the data are broken into packets and travel across multiple networks before being reassembled at their destination so this is the map generally how it works internet is connected through tcp ip and then bridge router and then it is sent to the local network and it is being connected to pcs i have indicated you can just go through it and then how the internet works addressing schemes in order to communicate across the internet a computer must have a unique address if it doesn't have unique address it cannot connect to the internet so that is the prerequisite just like to enter a particular place you need a ticket just like that so every computer on the internet has a unique numeric identifier called an internet protocol or ip address so mostly that ip address has four parts each part a number between 0 and 25 you can see that hmm so it is divided into four parts so an ip address might look like this 205461171104 so it may be two digit or it may be three digit it 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 changes from uh, from which server you use every server have their own specific ip addresses so in addition to an ip address most internet hosts or servers have a domain name system that is called as dns address which uses words so there you saw that it used digits so here it uses words a domain name identifies the type of institution that owns the computer an internet server owned by ibm might have the domain name ibm.com some enterprises have multiple servers and identify them with sub domains such as products ibm.com so ibm as you know that is a very uh, popular software company and this is how internet domains are divided into the name of the domain it may be .com or edu or gov 
and or mil or net or org so what does it mean so here the type of organization if it is commercial then it becomes commerce if it is educational it becomes edu if it is government it is gov and then if it is military it is mil and then if it is gateway or host or business or commercial then it is net and if it is other organization then it becomes typically non profit that is org so now you must have seen that in our academics we use it as ac dot in so what does this ac ac means academic in stands for india so e resources e resource means electronic resource electronic resource means soft resources which are available which are available in digital format so those which we find in library which we can touch which are uh, which we can uh, read which we can touch which we can uh, feel and then we can get it xerox I mean, not xerox but at least which we can feel it physically they are they don't fall under this category e itself means electronic so here technology has been an important driving force for change so whatever books they are they are being scanned and then they are put into these e resources information communication and technology has affected everyone's life of course it is it has virtually all libraries at least in most developed countries are now members of networks that greatly facilitate the location of sources of information and the gaining of access to them so now if you go to show the ganga in flipnet you can find that so many governments so many libraries of different different countries uh, have signed mou that is uh, memorandum of understanding uh, between one country to another country between one library to another library and they share those resources earlier when uh, uh, not long back in 2004 when i was pursuing my phd at that time i used, i had to borrow books from america because i was doing my uh, phd on american writer and they used to ship those books and i had to wait for almost uh, 15 days or maybe for one month and after reading them again i had to send them back so my university used to borrow it from that university and likewise whatever material books they wanted <clears throat> our university or that particular library of that particular university used to provide them if there is the if there is some pact or mou between both the universities or else it is not possible and virtually all libraries at least in the most developed countries are now members of networks that generally greatly facilitate the location of sources of information and the gaining of access to them so that is why uh, nowadays our thesis and mphil dissertations are being scanned and put into these databases so that any person across the globe can have a glance at our at our research work so just like that there are even ebooks and now in uh, amazon you will find kindle that is again uh, another form of uh, ebook <coughs> or e resource we are wherein you can find all types of electronic books on which you uh, for uh, you can uh, use it for reading or for any kind of academic development so here electronic publishing is the use of computers to design edit and distribute material that traditionally would have been produced on printing process so number of advantages than printed books so for printed books you have to wait for uh, for a week or again depending on the uh, courier services and all but for e books or e resources you just need to purchase them and then it will be instantly available online and you can download it and you can read or even now an audible dot in has audible dot in and audible dot com has been launched wherein audible means itself means audio audio books 
so now maybe that is the future so even that type of books are available that is what i am trying to say here <clears throat> And then what are the benefits of ebooks? Just now I told you. So, so thousands of full text ebooks from authoritative publishers you can get. And then authoritative references updated and in electronic format. 24 into 7 access from any internet connected computer. Unlimited simultaneous use. No more damaged pages or missing volumes. Read speaker technology. Allowing text to be read aloud to users and download in mp3 format cross searchable with select periodical collections and so on so forth <clears throat> and even on demand con content translation into other languages is also available so likewise there are e-journals as well information is one basic resource needed for development and prosperity information is nothing but the recorded experience that is used for decision making the world has moved from industrial revolution to in, in information revolution so modern world depends upon the information for social economic scientific and technical development as we all know the very fabric of scientific society is deeply rooted in primary sources for information that is periodicals one among that is journal published in electronic versions so from where we are going to retrieve all these sources, we are going to retrieve these sources, e-resources, e-books, e-journals through a database. And that database is stored and can be accessed through internet. So data is nothing but material. And base is a kind of a um, go down, we can say, a storage where we can store these all electronic material as you can see there in the image the retrieval of exact information today has become a difficult task due to the exponential exponential growth of the information in all fields of human knowledge and then the generation collection retrieval and dissemination of information through creation of databases and systematic information services are becoming essential to meet the increasing demand modern man expect information service more quickly rapidly and accurately that's why the present generation is very much uh, impulsive they don't have this uh, patience to wait for the things because everything is instant nowadays whatever you want it is being provided instantly Earlier, we used to go to a bank to get money uh, somewhere around from 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., that's it. But now, whenever you want, you can go to the ATM machine, just put your card and <clears throat> get the money. It is again what that is again thanks to electronics. So it is just an example. Likewise, you can just imagine without electronics or without these things, we cannot imagine about our present situation so modern man expect information service more quickly rapidly and accurately the advances in computer and telecommunication technologies simply this job in more sophisticated way that is the database creation so here databases are the medium which have changed the way we perceive and disseminate information they help to access any remote information and it also helps in activities of handling of information such as resource sharing, reference service, abstracting and indexing services, easy retrieval of information. And where do you find these like book databases, periodical databases, abstracting data, databases, statistical databases, census databases, etc. I have used so many uh, definitions. But then I hope that will serve its purpose. So like this, there is one e-resource which is open to access. You can access, anyone can access, have an access to this. So that is e-partishala. 
which is developed by the government of India. And the website, name of the website is www.epartshala.nic.in. So here you can find NCERT books, which are available free in digital version. They are available in a digital or soft copy. <coughs> and then 15 lakh students have downloaded ePartshala app. Visits in one year has crossed 30 million mark and it will go on multiplying year by year, day by day, year by year. So now the present generation and the future generation can be called as a digital generation. So likewise, there is one more <coughs> which is called epartishala.nic.in. And this is how it looks. You, heard, you can also install the app. And then there is one National Institute of Open Schooling, which also provides easy access to educational, educational materials for occasional programs at the level of secondary and senior secondary plus two levels. The project is carried out in partnership with state level institutions and organizations. So this is how the website looks like. There is all the information available there when it has been certified by the government and then about us, the information about that particular website and a particular institute and then how many departments are there and the programs and then the results of previous and if uh, currently recently if they have undertaken up any exams all the information related to those exams are shared over there and then even if you want to contact someone the contact numbers are also available and then the upcoming uh, lectures or the current lectures the time and subject everything is on display <clears throat> so likewise there is one more National Repository of Open Educational Resources, NROER. It is a collaborative platform provided by MHRD, Ministry of Human Resource Development, which brings together everyone interested in school and teachers across India. And it was launched in 2013. And it is a learning repository for open educational resources. And it is also a repository which provides a platform for creation and use of localized content available in variety of formats. <clears throat> so the repository offers dig digital resources for all school subjects and grades in multiple languages. So this is how the website looks like. And then E. PG Partishala project. This is an ini initiative of UGC for providing free access to standardized e-textbooks for postgraduate courses in different universities of the country. So likewise, the project is taken up under NMEICT and involves the development of high quality curriculum based interactive e-content in different subjects across all disciplines at postgraduate level. And this is how the website looks like. It is a gateway to all postgraduate courses. And then daily, the subjects and papers are being updated. And you can see almost all, most of the subjects and papers have been included. You can see almost more than 20,000 ebooks are there. And then 19,000 plus videos are there. 3,200 experts are affiliated with this. And then more than 30,000 quick quizzes have taken place. And then almost 70 subjects and 723 papers are in the database of this. And then there is one more Vidyamitra. Vidyamitra is an online learning portal for all the e-content projects developed under the NME ICT. It provides seamless across to e-content developed by various OER platforms and bring them under single 
umbrella, enabling user to access all e-content through single window platform. And then adopt a digital preservation strategies to ensure long-term availability of e-content. And this is how the website looks like. And then National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning, NPTEL. And even there is one channel, uh, which is almost uh, provided by all the platforms like Airtel, Tata Sky, Sun and other networks. So it was initiated by seven Indian IITs, that is Bombay, Delhi, Kanpur, Kharagpur, Madras, Guwahati and Roorkee, along with the IIC Bengaluru in 2003. So it aims to enhance the quality of engineering education in the country by providing easy access to curriculum based video and web courses in engineering and sciences. So this NPTEL channel is also there in YouTube. You can watch some of the videos related to this. And even you can directly go to uh, their uh, official website. And then there is the National Digital Library of India, launched in May 2016, and dedicated to the nation on June 19th, 2018. It is a national mission project by MHRD and IIT Kharagpur to empower citizens through digital literacy. So meta search of Indian OER repositories are available there. For example, Krishi Kosh, which are related with agriculture related information. Shodh Ganga, wherein we find all our thesis and dissertations uploaded. And then NPTEL, NCERT, e-textbooks, E Gyan Kosh, etc. There are a number of such websites wherein you can have an access to those OE resources. And this is how the website looks like. As you can see, there it is being financed and developed by MHRD, Minister of, Ministry of Human Resource Development, under the under collaboration with IIT of Kharagpur. And the National Knowledge Network is also there, which was established in 2010. And it aims to connect all educational institutions, universities, research institutions, libraries, healthcare and ag agricultural institutions across the country through a high bandwidth network. It marks a step towards creation of a knowledge society. So to conclude, information is essential as we know for all sources of human well-being. Without information, we can't help each other. So as information is essential, knowing information sources is also essential for effectiveness. So in fact, that is, that is what prompted me to take up this topic. And development depends on information and its proper use at proper time. So by sharing the information, I will be not robbed of that information, but while sharing that information, I will be having some more information from your side also. So by caring and sharing, we grow together. <clears throat> development depends on information and its proper use at proper time. So reading makes a perfect academician knowledge is power thank you and i hope i had done justice uh, to my topic and i would love to have some feedback from your side i don't know uh, when my program of course i think the uh, my lecture is scheduled on 31st and i would be very much keen to get your feedback and i would love to uh, address your anxieties your questions and I would uh, I take this opportunity to once again thank the organizers of this FDP program and uh, especially Dr. Uh, S.L. Patil sir for giving me an opportunity and believing in me and trusting in me. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.